what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. Okay, my minister. So there's a need to what? Continue. So the, the promise of holiness, the promise of being blameless, the promise of not having reproach in his sight is not an open promise. There's a condition. If you indeed do what? Continue where? In the faith. So the matter is the faith. So by the time we read through scriptures, we don't have that time, and we begin to do definition of terms. You will find out that what faith is, faith, 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 faith is. Faith is the firm belief Firm belief. Trust. And loyalty. To Jesus Christ. Belief in. Trust in. And loyalty to. Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. So there's a dimension of faith that is belief. So you believe in Jesus. In believing in Jesus, there's what we call the body of beliefs. There's, this, there's something that characterizes the Christian faith. And all of those things spawn out of our first believing in Jesus. Then there's a dimension of faith that is trust. Absolute confidence and dependency in Christ. And then there's a dimension of faith that is loyalty. So when Paul says, if indeed you continue in your belief in Christ, your trust in Christ, and your loyalty to Christ, grounded and steadfast. The word grounded and steadfast can be collapsed into one word. Being faithful. To be faithful is to sustain the character of being steadfast and loyal. Are you still with me? Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. Let me show you something. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Verse 19. Having what? Faith. faith. Having faith. And a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning what? The faith. So, having faith will be absolute trust. Are you with me? Which some have rejected concerning the faith will be now belief in Jesus. Are you with me? Yes, sir. The faith speaks about our belief in Christ. So the Bible will say contending for what? Which was what? what? Unto you. The faith. That is our belief. Our body of convictions as relates to our Christian reality. On account of the salvific work of Jesus Christ. But he says, having faith and a good conscience. Which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered what? Shipwreck. Next verse. Of whom are what? Hymenus and Alexander, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to what? Blaspheme. Praise God. So, how is it that you are able to shipwreck your faith? Paul says it's a good warfare. Where does the warfare occur? I want to start teaching now. Are you still with me? Where does the warfare occur? You see, as I, as I engaged God and I prayed, the Lord gave me three arenas of battle. Number one, poverty. Number two, pleasure. Number three, pain. Hmm. 
Number one, what did I call it? Poverty. Number two, what? Number three, what? Pain. See, brethren, if you can win your battles in these three areas, if you can win your battles in these three areas, you will not shipwreck your faith. Notice in First Timothy, he says, you have having faith and what? A good conscience. Which some people wandered away from. What did they wander from? The good conscience. Okay, let's put it in NLT. Help me. Give me NLT from verse 18. NLT. You will see how simple it is. NLT in verse 18. From verse 18. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions to you. Based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier, may they help you fight well where? In the Lord's battles. Next verse. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately done what? Violated their consciences. How did they do it? Deliberately. And because they have violated their consciences, as a result, their faith has been what? Shipwrecked. So how do they deliberately violate their consciences? It's either in the area that relates to the matters of poverty, or the areas that relate to the matters of pleasure, or the areas that relate to the matters of pain. Sure you know, that there are people now who are glorifying Yahoo, internet fraud. Are you aware? Yes, sir. And the way they are glorifying it is that they are saying, uh, not blame the boy. After all, after all, if they use them, they take care of his family. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So he's taking care of his family with stolen money. In fact, I've had a case here where a sister, I think it's a sister, I can't remember, came to me and said, she knows that her brother is using Yahoo money to take care of the family. And I said, if you didn't know, it's a different thing. Now that you know, eating from that money, you are an accomplice. If you eat, you are deliberately doing what? Violating what? Your conscience. And what will happen is that you will shipwreck your faith. You see, brethren, tonight, eh, in this poverty matter, I want to deal with some certain things, and I want us to go through the scriptures. You see, because there are many of you that have lost your trust in Jesus. You are willing to sell your loyalty to him, and your belief in him is shaking because you don't have money. And we can't blame you. There are all kinds of sayings that have been pushed around the body of Christ. For instance, without doing it intentionally in the body of Christ, we have seemed to give the impression that a rich Christian is more useful to God than a poor one. A rich Christian is more useful to the kingdom than a poor one. So somebody says things like, I will be a better Christian if I am rich. Are you with me? Yes. I will be a better believer. If I have money, I will be a better believer. Listen, on the part of spiritual progress, eh, understand this. On the part of spiritual progress, there are two dimensions that will characterize the Christian's advance. One, there is your spiritual life. Two, there is your spiritual witness. What did I call it? And spiritual what? Witness. So there is your living and there is your witnesses. As you advance on the path of spiritual progress, you are supposed to be deepening your spiritual life and strengthening your spiritual witness. Your spiritual life has to do with your relationship with the Lord. Are you here? Yes, sir. Stay with me oh, because... I know that this thing is going to cause, get me into trouble, but I have settled with Jesus. You're, in your spiritual life, you are supposed to be deepening your spiritual life. And what that has to do with is your relationship with the Lord. 
When somebody says, um, I will be a better Christian if I have money. Eh? He's speaking about either his spiritual life or his spiritual witness. And he's saying that my relationship with God will be deeper if I have more money. And my witness unto God will be stronger if I have money. So invariably, alternately, we are saying that a poor Christian cannot have a deep relationship with God. And a poor Christian cannot have a strong witness of Christ. What is witnessing? Witnessing is just representing Christ to the world. Are you with me? Yes, sir. How does money, money affect these two things? If you are honest, how? Does it mean that if you have more money, your prayer life will be improved? Does it mean that if you have more money, your love for God will be improved? Does it mean that if you don't have money, you cannot bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And you see, I'm willing to be put on the stake and killed if I am found to be wrong. I'm willing. But you see, brethren, I have studied Jesus once, twice, three times, a little more times. I've tried to read Jesus. Nobody followed Jesus and became a millionaire. None. None. There was no testimony in the Bible that it was the result of Jesus' teaching that brought men into prosperity. None. I'm not, listen, listen, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying it is wrong for a Christian to be rich. I'm not saying that riches are evil. I'm quoting Jesus, and I will show you Jesus. Why? The matters of your spiritual life in the Bible, the Bible tells you that riches are a snare. So when somebody is growing in, on the path of spiritual progress, and their primary desire is that I want to be rich, I want to be rich, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. Paul says that if you have those kind of desires, you will pierce yourself with many sorrows. We will see that scripture shortly. So the Bible counsels that such desires should not be found in the heart of a pilgrim. So when you are thinking that the proof of your love for God is in the size of your bank account, Satan has already won you in the arena of poverty. Many young people, many young people, the reason your Christian life is not working is that money has choked your faith. The desire for money. You don't know how long I've worked before God. I know the implications of what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. That there are people that are going to come out now and say, and he's trying to build a place that is going to cost 900 million. And see what he's teaching. Hear me, I've told you before, if God cannot send money to build the place, it will remain unbuilt. But the truth of the Bible will not be compromised on my tongue. God forbid. Do you know that I have found out, eh? I have found out, that the people that give the most to the work of God are the people that don't really have. I know. A lady reached me from Turkey after a Bible study. And in the, in the messages she sent to me, she was weeping. She said, I don't have a job. But when I heard you teach, God said, I should give everything I have to our same word. But you don't have work. She said, immediately I find a job. The minute I'm paid, I'm sending it. She got a job. They paid her $310. She sent everything to the last Kobo to the account for the project. To the last Kobo. The people who give the most are not necessarily the people that have so much. I have a brother in Canada. He supports us in this ministry <clears throat> with, to the best of his ability. He was telling me one day, he said, I don't have savings. The minute he finishes working, he's like a channel. God says, send money there. 
He can send one million here, send one million there, and he doesn't have anything left. Nothing in his savings. The people who sacrifice the most for God are the people that really don't have more than enough. They just have enough to take care of themselves and their families, but they've traveled so far into God that Satan can't use money to cripple their relationship with Jesus. Right now, Christians are envying thieves. Do you know, dear brother, that this is why in the church of Jesus Christ today, you will know that a politician killed, maimed, rigged his way to power. Our pastors, we give them opportunity to do thanksgiving in church. Why? With the thanks, it's not the thanksgiving that is the matter. With the thanksgiving, oh, may no COVID I. May the Lord give you understanding. So somebody that sings about breasts and nakedness and all kinds of immorality, he will also be giving mic to do thanksgiving in church. And you know what he's saying to the church? What the pastor is saying to the church is, all you young people here yeah, that are following God, you don't know how to make money. That you can come, you can, you can, you can, you can sing for Satan and then come and give thanks to a holy God. So people's faith are being shipwrecked because they are losing the war of poverty. Let me quote Jesus now. Or let me quote Paul first. Give me First Timothy chapter 6. Begin at verse 1. If you are still with me, say Amen. amen. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Verse 2. And those who are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with what? Godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, rivaling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of what? From such, what do you do? Draw yourself. Next verse. Now, godliness with what? Is what? Media, stay with me. Leave that verse there. Godliness with what? You see, in the arena of poverty, the war is for your contentment. That's the matter. At every state you are in life, are you contented? Or there is an ambition that continues to burn within your soul? An ambition. A lust. You know why? Because... Even within the Christian space, what we call success is a lie. We use the world's definition of success to define the success of a man's life. Oh my God, I won't have time to read it, so let me tell you. Remember in the book of Luke, a man came to meet Jesus. He said, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. Do you remember that story? And Jesus, you see, when I read Jesus, I can joke with other things in the scripture, and I don't, I don't mean that literally. I'm just being metamorphorical. Whether it's correct or not, I will know at home. <laughs> now, Jesus looked at a man. A man came there and said, tell my brother, it's my share. It's my share. My father's inheritance is supposed to be shared for two of us. Jesus, instead of addressing the matter, looked at the man and said, there's something wrong with you. He said, beware of what? 
covetousness. Oga, Baba J, they brought matter of injustice to you. Somebody is trying to trample on my rights. Somebody is treating me badly. You leave the matter of injustice and then you go to matter of covetousness. And then Jesus takes that opportunity to teach something critical. He says, a man's life does not consist of the things that he what? So that means the way heaven measures men has nothing to do with what the man has. Hmm. God looks beyond what you drive. He looks beyond what you wear. He looks beyond what is in your bank account to determine your worth. While the earth measures men's worth by the... They taught you in Urobo, taught some of you in Yoruba. You went to school and graduated with a 2-1. But you're under pressure. Everybody in your compound is putting their, their children in Tiny Tots International. <laughs> British Montessori. <laughs> Le Buravaka. Now you can't sleep in the night. <laughs> we used to live on Jakpa Road. We now moved to Otokutu. We removed our daughters from the school because at that time, Foel was 167. We removed them and brought them closer. Because by the time you drive there, drive back, you can't sustain it. Many of you, your faith is shipwrecked. You're under pressure. Because you don't want to be poor. You don't want anybody to laugh at you. So Satan has given you an assignment that God didn't send you. Godliness with contentment. What is the gain? What is the gain here? Great gain. Your faith will not be shipwrecked. You will make it to the finish line. Satan cannot hold something over your neck. You say the reason she's sleeping around is because her mother cannot pay her school fees. Drop out. Drop out. Go and defer your admission and go and fry her car. With your pointed nose, sit in front of frying pan. Fry her car and raise your school fees. And go back to school with honor and with pride. But poverty. That's why some churches now, the whole administration and the whole thing about the church is running on Yahoo money. Yahoo money. Thieves are funding the work of God. Thieves. Because we are losing the war. Everybody is afraid of poverty. We don't want the world to see us like we are failing. You know, I grew up in church and I used to wonder. How did we reach the conclusion hmm, in Genesis chapter 2 that the four rivers that are watering the Garden of Eden have to do with resources? I grew up in church hearing preachers say you should have a minimum of four sources of income. That there were four rivers watering Eden. They use it in motivational preachings, use it every, and then you will leave the meeting. You've not even been able to sustain one. They say if you don't have four, you are finished. So the average young man is under pressure. His faith, his belief, his trust, and his loyalty is now at stake. So the average young person can do anything for money. See, brethren, the recommendation of the Bible is hard work. Will all of us be rich? Nobody knows. Whether I'll be rich and you'll be richer than me, nobody knows. 
that is within the poor view of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. The way the Christian life is designed is that those that have are supposed to take care of those that don't have. That's the design. They say they that had lands sold it and brought it to the apostles' feet. Such that there was none amongst them that lacked. None. The Bible says none that lacked. None that lacked. That's the principle me I'm operating on. That's why I will come here and tell you about the building. And those that have been blessed by God to that level will now make sacrifice. And then we are giving. We are giving. Little by little, the place is getting built. Little by little, the place is getting built. On the backs of people who have determined that my resources belong to Jesus. But to have an ambition that the only way you will be able to prove your witness to the world is in the abundance of riches. Satan has sifted you. Sifted you. That's why there are girls now, eh? Christian girls, that are ashamed of what they have become. They've sold their body for money. There are people sitting here now Compromise has finished your life. Because if you don't win the war of resources, if you don't come to this place where you are contented, hmm? in that place of poverty, what Satan wants you to do is that he wants you to compromise. There are three things he's trying to achieve. He wants to achieve compromise, he wants to achieve worship, and then he wants to steal your devotion. So there are many who are depressed because they don't have money. Many who are, are planning now that if they get an opportunity to do something against God, they will do it. Brethren, don't believe me. Just go and read the news. Just, just, do, just do a little research yourself and find out. Pastors, so-called pastors in this country have been arrested for organizing Ponzi schemes. Pastors are manipulating markets, financial markets. Pastors are engaging in all kinds of things, whether it is shares, whether it's stocks, whether it's crypto. They are doing all kinds of things on the ground just to make money. And when they've made the money, they still come back and stand to represent Jesus. You see, brethren, I fear for the end of the age. Because you see, the, the pastor will think now that he has gotten away with it. Hmm? He has manipulated things and become rich over people's blood. But as a judge of the whole earth. And one day, every man will give account of the things he has done. Every man. So in the arena of finances, of poverty, hmm? Satan is after you compromising. He's after you worshipping money. And then he's after your devotion. He wants to cripple your devotion. Let's finish the scripture. Go to verse 7. For we brought nothing where? And it is certain that what? Next verse. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be what? Content. Having food and clothing. If the presence of luxury or the absence of luxury can affect your spiritual life and your spiritual witness, your Christianity is fake. What I'm saying is, if riches are what you are waiting for to make you a better Christian, or if poverty is what has not allowed you to become a better Christian. Your Christianity is a fraud. You are fake. 